see your hands again here for the first time. Would you like to share? Namaskar, uh, I'm Lavanya. I'm here for the first time. I was introduced to this Iskan um, with um, um, Damodar Prabhu. We were very uh, far relatives of them. So it's very happy for me. I'm currently expecting and I did 32 rounds today. And I'm very, very happy today and excited. Um, it's a peaceful environment here. And also with the water in front and the way when I'm chanting the, in the hall, the uh, vibrations that I see with all the uh, rounds that are being done by all the people here, I'm really very happy and very peaceful here. Thanks for uh, giving this opportunity to getting us here, especially for Damodar Prabhu and family. Thank you. I have a lot of distractions in chanting. Here is the first time I am chanting without any, very peacefully. Like I am able to walk around alone and chant. Yeah, I'm, it's a very new experience for me. Yeah, I'm loving it. How many rounds did you complete so, so far today? 40. 40? Oh, very good. Oh. It's going on. Working on 41. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Can you give that mic? and chanting my rounds <laughs> and you won't believe this uh, I found a small perfectly formed conch shell which I think as a message from Krishna that all will be well <laughs> but whatever happens I'm sure it's, uh, it's uh, uh, Krishna's uh, will I thought you were going to tell us your colleague you showed up at the chapter retreat also <laughs> <laughs> no How many chanted more rounds today than they've ever chanted before? Wow. Can we hear from you about how many rounds you chanted and what your experience was? Well, um, today I chanted 57 rounds. 57 Ooh. rounds. Peaceful environment. Especially in the morning when everybody was in the lecture. The, um, it was like really clear and peaceful. You were outside when everyone was in the lecture. <laughs> and it was really peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 57. 
you have a goal to finish more than 57 today? What's your goal? 64. Wow. Okay. How old are you? 11. 11. How many rounds did you chant today? I chanted um, 45 rounds. 25 today. rounds. 45. 45? <laughs> really? Yeah. Now that's a first for you, right? No. No? More than last, that? Before? Last Jafari cheat, I um, chanted 64 rounds, and I'm planning to chant. Um, this Jafari I'm planning. I was, I was planning to chant 90 rounds, but then, wow. but then I thought it was too much. So I okay. rounds. You're, you're aiming for 64 by the end of the day. Okay. Let's see what happens. How about you? I chanted 57 rounds. 57 rounds. You together, chanting together? Ah. And this wasn't my highest because last year last I year? chanted 64 rounds. 64 last year. And, and, uh, Did you find it easy or was it more of a struggle this year? It was, it was really easy because I stayed in my cabin most of the time because it was really cold outside. Ah. But then after some more of this very same thing, maybe later and certainly tomorrow some sharing. Uh, the topic is, is deliberately it's a lot easier topic than this one. Spiritual sound vibration nature of spiritual sound vibration. This is something I often speak about in non-devotee venues because the you know, spiritual sound vibration is something. Easy for them to hear. But this is a devotee hmm. audience, so I'll speak on the same topic a little bit more comprehensively. The Sanskrit term for spiritual sound vibration is Shabda. Brahman. Brahman meaning of the spiritual world, and Shabda is sound of the spiritual world or spiritual sound vibration and spiritual sound vibration exists even before creation it exists during the period of cosmic manifestation and it continues to exist after cosmic annihilation it's it's brahman it's eternal so the very nature of spiritual sound vibration is different, although uh, there are some things that overlap. Do you know what a Venn diagram is? Anybody not know what a Venn diagram is? Everybody knows. Okay. See, older folks, you don't know what a Venn diagram is. Here's a circle, and here's a circle. And then you can move the circles to a place where there's some overlap. There's some overlapping. Then there's some things that are different and things that are different. But there's some things that are similar. That's so with spiritual sound vibration, there's some things that are similar to material sound vibration. And there's some things that are different. Generally, sound vibration, we think of, the major difference is consciousness and also spiritual potency. So, with material sound vibration, it's, there's a broadcaster and there's a receiver, like, you know, the mouth and the ear. Someone says something and we hear that something, or somebody, you know, makes a sound and we hear the sound. It's material sound vibration.
spiritual sound vibration may be like that too, but it doesn't have to be like that. Just like spiritual sound vibration exists even before there's ears and broadcasters, before, before creation, directly existing in the spiritual world. So when it's manifest in this world, there may be that which broadcasts the sound, like rishis. They have receivers that can receive Shabda Brahman, and they have broadcasters that can vibrate it for mantra and other means. So they're the receiver, and then the broadcaster is Narayan, who broadcasts the sound, and the rishis receive the sound, and they repeat that sound, and then we can hear that sound. So we can connect with the spiritual realm by that method. And then somebody hears the rishi. They may not have the receiver to receive from Narayan. Some, something like what Lord Brahma did at the time of um, appealing for Krishna to appear in this world. Mother Earth, in the form of a cow, approached the demigods. Help! Too many demoniac kings. And so the demigods went to Lord Brahma, and Lord Brahma brought the demigods to the shore of the Milk Ocean, and together they offered prayers, specifically the Purusha Sukta prayers. And then Lord Vishnu replied in such a way that only Brahma could hear, and he was told to pass on the message to the demigods, because they didn't have the receiver. And so Lord Krishna said, or Lord Vishnu said, soon I will appear. And please tell the demigods they should make their appearance first in the family of the Yadu and Boja and Andaka dynasties. So that's a spiritual sound vibration. And Brahma then passed on that vibration. Although he was using material mouth and they were using their material ears, they could receive that spiritual sound vibration. It's not less spiritual that Brahma vibrated it and the demigods heard it then Lord Vishnu vibrated it and Lord Brahma heard it because it's the quality of the sound it's primordial sound so with that primordial sound um, in the language of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Shikshastakam Nam Nam Akari Bahuda Nijasarva Shaktihi. We discussed that in one of our classes. Nijasarva Shakti. The, the, within that spirit, Shabda Brahman or spiritual sound, there's inconceivable potencies. For example, in the sound, Hare Krishna is everything because the name of Krishna and Krishna are the same, they're non different, they're ab Krishna is absolute. So within the name of Krishna is everything, the whole spiritual world. I mean, think about it for just a moment. Although we're not, our receiver isn't so well equipped. But at least from those who are well equipped, they, they've told us that um, where there's Krishna, is Krishna ever alone? No. If Krishna is not alone, then who is he with? He's he, wherever Krishna is, his whole spiritual abode is there. Krishna and his abode are not separate. Krishna and his loving associates are there in his abode with him. So when you say Krishna, there's Krishna Loka, there's the river Jamuna, there's the cows and the cowherd boys and the calves and the peacocks and the gopis and Nandagram and you know the, the whole spiritual realm is there and all their loving affairs just in that sound Krishna it's all there Krishna's dancing on your tongue when you just say Krishna and with Krishna dancing on your tongue all of that's on your tongue it's a very compact very filled with Sarva Shaktis, all spiritual potencies. 
within each and every name of Krishna. So that's that spiritual sound vibration. We can't say that about material sound vibration. With material sound vibration, not only it doesn't have all those potencies, the sound and the object are different. Like the word chair and the object chair. You can't sit on the word. <laughs> but you can sit on a chair and the, the word is different than the object. That's material sound vibration. Just a little education on how, how special and how fortunate we are to be in contact with spiritual sound vibration and why it's so important for spiritual development, for spiritual realization. You okay? Just want to be in the sun because it's too cold? Um, then Shabda Brahman can be recorded. So it can be recorded on what are, like these devices. It's not less because it's on a device. Or it can be in a book. Like a very common in our temples, I've noticed Gujaratis have a thing they like to write Ram Nam fill up books with writing the name of Ram. Maybe in other parts of India do it too, but it's very common. So that writing of Hare Krishna is not any different than the sound. So the sound is spoken by the mouth and heard by the ear. That's one kind of Shabda Brahman. The other is writing it. Just like scripture. Like this discussion we had the other day on the Didi installation. What's the, what's the difference between um, Holy Scripture in a book. Why do we speak like that? Why, why is that conception there? The Holy Quran, the Holy Bible, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, the Vedas. We revere them, we hold them. What's it called? Grantha Sahab in Sikh religion? Guru Grantha Sahib. Guru, okay. Guru Grantha Sahib. So, it's sacred. But, but what is it? Well, from the material point of view, it's paper, so it's trees, it's petroleum, it's cotton, and maybe some minerals and pigments. That's what it is. So what makes that sacred? It's the words that are on the page that makes it sacred. The, the language um, in... Western or Christian religion at least is revealed scripture the Word of God the Bible is the Word of God but it's just so from a material point of view it's just like this recording device or the book it's material but it, it's recorded Shabda Brahman so when, when Prabhupada was writing his books we, we not just the verses because they're spoken by Shukadeva Goswami or Krishna and Arjuna speaking or exactly Sanjaya saying Krishna said this and Arjuna said that <coughs> but it's, it's spiritual sound vibration even in its recorded form it, it, that's, so what I'm saying here is the boundaries of what is Shabda Brahman is not the same that applies to the boundaries of material sound vibration it goes beyond those boundaries. It's, it's the, the, the source of that sound vibration and then the consciousness of that source. Like Srila Prabhupada in his purports, he would, he would write something or say something. Just take something ordinary that people say to each other every day. Like, how are you today? And we may say something like that, and the consciousness behind that something that we say is material sound vibration. But when Prabhupada would say the same words, the consciousness behind the question was different. And so it acted upon the receiver in a different way. Because the consciousness was different. So even those things that we might say, they're scripture, 
the Prabhupada spoke and then there's other things the Prabhupada spoke and we make a distinction. So in one sense there is a distinction, but in another sense there's not a distinction because of the consciousness behind that sound vibration. The, the, the presence of Krishna within his consciousness make the sound vibration um, have a spiritual effect, a spiritualizing effect by the consciousness behind the speaker. And then two other things, just, and I'm done, two other things about spiritual sound vibration. Um, The Rupa Goswami, he writes in the Dagta Madhava. Oh yeah, one of them is we require for sound vibration, we require a receiver. So the receiver can be the book, the receiver can be the, the device, the receiver can be your ear, but the receiver has to be on. Our consciousness has to be in a receptive mode in order to get the full benefit of spiritual sound vibration. Spiritual sound vibration acts anyway, just like the grass or the, uh, an insect in that building where we're staying and hearing all that chanting. If it's affecting us, surely it's affecting all the living entities that are creeping and crawling and flying and you know whatever it is that they're doing. Hearing that sound vibration acts even if consciousness isn't developed. But to get the full effect, then the, the, the receiver needs to be um, in good order. So that, for us, that, that's called purification. How we get purification is both... The, it, 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 the chanting is the means to get purification, and the end and when there's purification is then we can receive the fullness. Is the point clear? Should I say it again? We chant when we're not purified to become purified. And so it's the means. And it's also the end. When we're purified, then we can then we can receive the fullness. That's the effect of Shabda Brahman, spiritual sound vibration. It doesn't work that way with material sound vibration. And then just speaking about receivers, just like this little microphone here. It's also receiving the sound, but there isn't consciousness on the other end. So the effect may be... Um, you're familiar with the word tadiya? Tadiya means in relation to the Lord. Just like in our Chicago temple, some of you may have visited there. We have Gornatai altar and Kishore Kishori altar and Jagannath Baladev and Subhadra altar in the front, there, there's a, uh, a stone that looks like it's a shila, but it's not a shila, it's tadiya, it's paraphernalia from a Nishringa temple. Very, very, very ancient Nishringa temple. I don't know exactly the history, but somebody that went to India and they were gifted. Um, I think from Mahovalam. They were gifted a, uh, a stone from a very ancient temple. It's now on our altar as Lord Nishinga Tadiya, paraphernalia. Just like on our altar, when we use, we go to a Murti store, paraphernalia store, and we buy a bell for our deity worship or, you know, some, the Achman cups and, and things that we use for our deity worship. By using them in our deity worship, the the the, the octail fan and the, the peacock fan, all those things, when used in worship of the deity, they take on a spiritual quality. They become tadiya, or spiritual paraphernalia. 
by the medium of service and the medium of sound vibration. They don't. They they can act to spiritualize. It's like what we we chant with Tulsi beads. And there's a reason we chant with Tulsi beads instead of other things, because Tulsi is a pure devotee, and so just by touching the the, the wood of the Tulsi, it's sanctifying uh, our sense of touch. We're becoming benefited spiritually just by touching Tulsi. What to speak of connecting the the the, the chanting with the touch of the Tulsi bead? It's enhancing our the efficacy of our act of chanting the holy name. So the microphone, back to the microphone, it's not conscious. It's just receiving the sound with some whatever, however the technology works and sending the signal to the amplifier and the amplifier and the speaker and you hear the sound. So, the, but the microphone's not conscious, but the grass and the insects and human beings because of the presence of the soul within, they're conscious. And because of when that spiritual sound vibration touches consciousness, it awakens directly this dormant spiritual or Krishna consciousness through sound. <coughs> so what we've been doing at this Japa retreat is exposing ourselves extensively over a sustained period of time to spiritual sound vibration. It's, it's likened, Prabhupada has given this analogy, of taking an iron rod and putting the iron rod in fire and making the fire hot, like the blacksmith. So the iron rod that's in the fire takes on qualities like the fire. So then it starts acting like fire. You take it out of the fire and touch it to um, paper, and it'll start a fire. It's although it's iron, it's fire. It acts like fire. So similarly, ourselves by being exposed to Shabda Brahman, spiritual sound vibration, we're becoming purified. We're becoming spiritually energized. We 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 can transmit that capacity of the spiritual sound vibration just by hearing the spiritual sound vibration, just by our being in contact with that. We become transmitters of that potency. You know, not even not even intentionally, just it happens. The iron rod doesn't decide, hey, I think I want to become like fire. Just by putting it in fire, it acts like fire. So even unknowingly, um, exposing ourselves to the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra in an extensive way like we've done today. Very, very powerful for ourselves and for those who we may, and it, as mentioned, it's, it has its eternal benefit that the, take the iron rod out of fire and put it over to the side and it'll cool down and become not like fire anymore. So it's temporary. But the, the spiritual effect of contacting the Holy Name, it, it, the effect, our consciousness may go down a bit compared to, to today when we've been very much absorbed in chanting. But the spiritual benefit is permanent. It's eternal. Even after this life. And that's the effect of spiritual sound vibration. So we have choices. We can hear and vibrate material sounds. And we can hear and vibrate spiritual sounds. And if we look at, you know, the, the benefits and detriments of both, it's, it's a real easy choice. So as far as we can, of thoughtful persons, Bhagavatam says the, those persons with sufficient intelligence in the sage of Kali, they take to the chanting of the holy name. For the, for, by discriminating this from that, here's the benefit of chanting 
spiritual sound vibration and especially chanting the spiritual sound vibration in the company of other spiritually minded persons. It's kind of just like taking a look back on, on what we've been doing the last two days, primarily today, but preparing ourselves and then immersing ourselves in the chanting. in the past with, with, with this session is uh, spend time just hearing questions or concerns or doubts or whatever, just topics in relation to, ideally, to topics in relation to chanting the Holy Name. Let's see if there are devotees that would like to begin. Generally, it's the beginning part is the slow part. Any comments or questions from anybody? Yes. Maharaj, you said that using Tulsi beads, when you use that, it also helps us purify, right? Yeah. But we generally use neem beads. So, is it recommended that we can use Tulsi beads? It's recommended. Can anyone use Tulsi beads? Huh? Can anyone, anyone use Tulsi beads? Sure. Sure. <coughs> now, if, if what's available is neem, use neem. But if you can get Tulsi beads, change them. We have both Tulsi and Neem, but for novice people, it's generally suggested that you use Neem. I never heard that one before. Okay, I know it's so that uh, There's some on this ISKCON projects going around, so one of them is if you're not initiated, you should not use uh, Tulsi. And this is pretty much why Okay, well let me repeat what Prabhupada said. He never said anything. I could say it three times. Trump has never said anything like that. <laughs> no, it, how it began, I remember the, you know, the first beads that I chanted on, and you can read about it in Lilamrita, this is what we did. We went to a, you know, an arts and crafts store, we bought some beads, bought some string, and strung beads. You know, had little, little wooden beads with little knots in between the wooden beads. And that's how we made our beads. Because we didn't, you know, going to India was like, who goes to India? <laughs> and then when we went to India, we found there's Tulsi beads. Oh, so we got Tulsi beads. But, you know, so you can chant on anything. You can chant on your toes. <laughs> but it's not that... Nothing that I know that Prabhupada gave us as a vidhi. If you're not initiated, don't chant on Tulsi. Only when you're initiated, then you can chant on Tulsi. We need all the mercy we can get. And if there's mercy from chanting on Tulsi, get it. That's the standard. So I don't know what's going around. I didn't even hear that it's going around. I, it's first I've heard this, but it's, it, it's not part of how our founder Acharya trained us. Yeah. They say because some people who are eating meat, they should not touch Well, whatever the reason is, I want to see what the scripture is. You could say that about chanting. You shouldn't chant until you stop eating meat. Because you know you're making offense with the same mouth, and you're eating meat, and you're you're chanting. That's what they say. Okay, well, I'm using another kind of logic to that logic. <laughs> and then, aside from logic, where's the scripture? I don't know that there's any scripture. It's certainly not something that our founder Charya gave us. Maybe there is something, and maybe that something has to do with smart to Brahmana regulations, and not with you know Vaishnava regulations. Remember one time we were visiting in Jagannath Puri, and it was really hot, like it often is in Jagannath Puri. 
And we were having kirtan going through the streets of Jagannath Puri. And we went by the temple. And the priests came out with their arms across their chest, heads tilted back, pointing at the ground. We didn't know what they were doing. They were pointing at the fact that we had our shoes on while we were having kirtan. You're not supposed to have your shoes on while you're having kirtan. According to them. But, you know, nam nam akarnipa sarva shakti stantravita niyamata na smarane na kalaha There's not, there's not so, such rules and regulations. Perhaps for those who are not Vaishnavas and are smart to such rules and regulations, but Lord Chaitanya's teaching. <coughs> at any place, at any time, you can chant the holy name. With your shoes on and with your shoes off. And before the deity or or in the bathroom. You can't do that with other things, but the holy name, there's no rules and regulations. I was just reading, uh, someone was um, bringing to Prabhupada's attention. Um, they were having kirtan in front of one of the deities in Vrindavan. I think it was in Vrindavan. And then they came back and told Prabhupada what their experience was. They said, Prabhupada, we were, we were chanting in front of the deity. And the Pujari came out and said, oh, this is very nice. Keep chanting, and one day, <clears throat> maybe you'll be able to take your birth in Vrindavan. And then, what, then Prabhupada said, what did you say? He said, we don't know what to say, Prabhupada. That's what we we're asking you. He said, you should have told them, you keep doing your deity worship in Vrindavan, and one day, maybe you'll be able to take birth in, the, in this country. Engage in sacred job. This is anything goes time. There's a book written by Bhakti Minot. One of his 100 books is a book called Hari Nama Chintamani. And the title of it comes from the Padma Purana verse that speaks about the holy name. Nama Chintamani Krishna Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Purna Shuddho Nitya Mukto Abhinatram Nama Namino. So from that verse he wrote Harinama Chintamani. The, the um, holy name acts like a Chintamani stone. It transforms everything into spiritual that it touches. And it's a discussion between Haridas Thakur and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in a very similar kind of um, dynamic as with Lord Chaitanya and Ramananda Roy where Lord Chaitanya is asking questions Ramananda Roy is giving the answers so in this case Lord Chaitanya is asking about the holy name and Haridas Thakur is giving the answers so in the final chapter there's this discussion of the sequence of Nama, Rupa, Guna, and Lila, with the excellent, several very nice things that are said, because the name is everything, within the name is everything. So we don't need something to augment the name, because everything is within the name. When one properly or offenselessly chants the name, automatically within the heart or the mind's eye will appear the form. Krishna will show his form. We don't have to meditate on his form and then listen to, and listen to the chanting. We listen to the chanting. The form will be revealed. 
that then from the form, the qualities of Krishna that correspond with his nice form. And then the, the pastimes. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur, or Har Haridas Thakur, gives this very, very nice uh, metaphor. The name is like an ocean. So everything within the ocean is within the name. The name, everything within the name is like an ocean of nectar. And within the ocean, there's big waves. So if you're immersed in the ocean, you'll then encounter the big waves. That's the form of Krishna. But you can't encounter the form of Krishna without the name. The name. You see, you hear Krishna before you'll see Krishna. Nice word. And then in between the big waves, there are small waves. And that's the qualities that accompany the form of Krishna comes his qualities. And then when the big waves and the small waves mix, then there is his pastimes. But it's all within the ocean. So immerse yourself in the ocean of the nectar of the holy name properly. And in sequence, the form of Krishna will be revealed, the qualities of Krishna will be the, the pastimes of Krishna will be revealed accessed all through the name in sequence Nama Rupa Guna Lila spiritual sound vibration discloses everything the whole of the Vedic wisdom is based upon sound and then and then details and details and details through that sound vibration Anything else? Yeah. So in the beginning you said that uh, Krishna gives the sound to Lord Brahma and then he wants to go and take the mm -hmm. sound. So when Brahma is the I don't know what Prabhupada says in that section of the Bhagavatam. I, I'd, ha I'd like to see what, what you're referring to, that Prabhupada said such and such. Um, commonly, in situations like this one, you just you know that the Brahma Vimohan Lila, it's it's mysterious in one sense. And how can the founder of the Sampradaya, the original preceptor of all Vedic wisdom, not understand Krishna's position? And that's why Vimoha. He became bewildered. So that bewilderment of Brahma, Krishna teaches in 9.30 Bhagavad Gita, how we should see it. Sadureva Samantha. What Brahma did, not only he was mistaken, but he, he did something that was not nice. He stole the calves and put them in a cave. Then he stole the coward boys and put them in a cave. Not nice. But he was in that bewildered state in one sense, it was arranged by Krishna to show the glory of Krishna so that we could, to this day, recite Brahma's realization that they, Krishna's position, once again, that he had already recognized in Brahma Samhita before even creation, before he even got going. Because all the calves and the cowherd boys then became forms of Krishna, of equal likeness. And then he showed them, it's not just calves and cowherd boys, it's me. And then this wonderful prayer by Lord Brahma, after that Vimoha Mila, 
he states for our edification Krishna is the origin of Narayan which is a restatement a reconfirmation of something that's said very early in the Bhagavatam Krishna is the original source of all expansions including the expansion of Narayan not vice versa <coughs> from that Brahma Vimohan Leela so Krishna wanted to do a number of things so he arranged for Brahma to became, become bewildered so he could have this wonderful Leela where he could show that he's the source of Narayana of Vaikuntha and so that he could be he could fulfill the desire of the mothers that wanted Krishna as their son so for one year they got Krishna as their son and all the cows for one year they had Krishna as their calf <coughs> to fulfill the desire of the residents of Vrindavan for their loving relationship with Krishna through the agency of his dear devotee Lord Rama and so that you can sit here in Fort Flagler Park and ask you know how did Brahma become bewildered <laughs> Krishna wanted to do all those things. So we can be reminded of his unique position. And, you know, in rasa, he could fulfill the, the happiness of love of the elder gopis who loved Krishna more than their own son. Prabhupada remarks, what, what mother in the world ever has loved another son more than their own son? It's not motherly. They may love another boy, but they not, not the same as their son. But in Vrindavan, they love Krishna more. That the quality of love in Vrindavan. So Krishna fulfilled their desire. He became their son. And so that Maharaj Prichit could come back to Krishna very quickly. Directly stated. Yeah, yeah. Now if you if you watch the Sarat Sargar Mahabharat video, it's the other way around. And people grow up in India watching Sarat Sagar's Mahabharat series. And that's how it is. Sagar Obacha. <laughs> Not Vyasa Deva Vacha. <laughs> On the authority of scripture you can know Krishna likes it. That's how we know things. Now subjectively there may or may not be some realization of the statements of scripture. But that doesn't prove or disprove. If it's not there, oh then it must then I still don't know. On the authority of scripture, we can know. Even if even even if we if we just the, the effort necessary to perform that sacrifice, just like we read, you know, directly from Shukadev Goswami saying to Maharaj Prichit, it's, it's, the, it's the best of all austerities. It's austere to do anything. You just live in the world for a day. And there's austerities. Everybody knows different kinds, different levels and different degrees. Some have it more difficult and less difficult. But of all sacrifices, the best, right, right in Bhagavad Gita, of all sacrifices and the chan chanting of the sacred mantra, sacred syllable, japa. So, Krishna is pleased. That's how we can
And if we if we engage in that sacrifice in a quality way, we'll also have another internal verification or confirmation. But that's more having to do with the qualitative way that we chant rather than whether Krishna is pleased or not. He's pleased that we're making the sacrifice. And that's that's our life is to please Krishna. You have something. You're enthusiastic. You're welcome. Who wrote it? What's the second question? <laughs> we got the second one. You only had one, okay. Um, who wrote the Upanishads? Huh? Yeah. So, where did Vyasadeva get... So, it's in the Kali Sanartana Upanishad, the Maha Mantra, exactly as we say it. In Kali Sanartana Upanishad. And the Upanishads are written by Vyasadeva. And where did Vyasadeva get the material for his writing? Did he, like, go on a creative writing spree? <laughs> or did he write down something that already existed? Second one. The Vedas were already existing, he just wrote them down. So, how do they become, where do they come from? If they were already existing and then he wrote them down, where'd they come from? Narayan. And where does Narayan come from? Expansion of Krishna. Okay. But Vyasadeva wrote it down. And it was existing before in sound. Shabda Brahman. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's like uh, they say that uh, the count should be like 16 on this day, 16 and multiples of 16. What well, you can do it differently. So what is the significance? What's the significance of 16? Sixty-four rounds makes one lakh of names. So there, there is. Bhakti Vinod Thakur calls it numerical strength. It's a vrata that I will chant one lakh of names. So when with that, then the beads. Just, we don't have to count how many names. We just keep moving the beads and the beads do the counting for us like an abacus it does it for us so it's a vrata that's the significance of 64 and then you know even one name is nice but Bhakti, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur I can't remember where I read it but in some of his writings he indicates it's, it's nice to increase in multiples of four. Four, eight, twelve, sixteen. Like that. So sixteen is twenty five thousand. And for us it's sixteen because we couldn't do much more than that. We're we're, you know, passionate Westerners. When it started, the Hare Krishna movement started, the devotees found out there was such a thing called initiation. So they asked Prabhupada, Can someday you're going to perform initiation? He said, yes, but you have to chant. This is Mukunda. The day before, he was Michael Grant. And Prabhupada said, yes, but you must chant 64 rounds. And Michael Grant was silent. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, well, then 32 rounds. You must chant 32 rounds, then you can be initiated. And he was still silent. They said, well, no less than 16. I'm not going any lower than 16. <laughs> <laughs> like negotiating. <laughs> so it became 16. Because, you know, we passion and run around and do stuff, and that's 16 is 
So it can be more, 16 minimum. Yeah. That was the standard Prabhupada set for initiation. Just like that. The famous story. Anything else? Yes? I couldn't hear so well. <laughs> Relay system? Tell you such another? How does he know? Because he's conscious and he's in everybody's heart. How does Krishna know in the spiritual world? Because he's right before us. Oh, that's a nice question. Because he's fully conscious and we have a relationship with him. That's a nice question. No problem. He creates, he's, he's the source of time. No problem. For us it's a problem to know, like, you know, what's happening now. But for Krishna it's not a problem because he's, his consciousness is full. <coughs> So here's another answer to your question about, you know, how does Krishna know because about all living as these, because he's in the heart and he's conscious. But he doesn't have to be in the heart either. He's in, he's in every atom. He doesn't, have to, he doesn't have to do anything. He's fully conscious, period. Everything that exists is under his direction. It doesn't move without his direction. Now in the material world, he directs the material energy through his will. And through his will, the modes of nature act, and the, the modes of nature act, and stuff goes flying. The wind blows, and the sun shines, and people get happy and sad, and, you know, things happen. Through the agency of his will. Estimating Krishna's capacity for being omniscient, all-knowing. That's the frog in the well kind of contemplation. Well, yeah. I can only know about things this way, so how does Krishna know about the, uh, everything? It's his nature, he's omniscient. How can we know about anything? We can't even know about anything without the assistance of Krishna helping us know about something. fully dependent, he's fully independent. Yes? Uh, Maharaj, uh, last year in this session, in yes. Kibar, we, we were discussing about time, and yeah. sometimes we have less time, and uh, you explained that Krishna is the source of time, so yes. we would make sure that we have, uh, you know, we have enough concentration to make things happen. So, uh, I've been trying to do my rounds in the and there are days, of course, when I feel that yes, my concentration is improved, I'm more peaceful, so I'm able to get more work done than usual. But there are also days when, you know, I have some things due, I have some assignments due the next morning, or I have a paper the next morning, and since I spend time in the morning worshipping Krishna, there is less time in the end of the day. So I was wondering if I could learn by your example, what should my mood be at the end of the night if I feel frustrated and have less time because of the fact that I was doing that in the morning. Okay, the, the, your, the details of the question is important, so let me make sure, say, let me say back. How do I, this is the evening time, and I'm looking at, I have some work to do tomorrow morning. Yeah, in the night, like There's a deadline. And I have to meet the deadline on whatever it is. And I have my devotional practice also. And those two things had to fit in the same space. No, no. My question is that I do my devotional service in the morning. Yeah. I, I give priority to it since last year because that's what... Congratulations. But in the night, I feel sometimes, actually most of the times, because there's a deadline, I feel frustrated that I wasted my time in the morning 
and now I'm not able to do my work. <laughs> Okay. Um, let me ask you a frank question. Is it possible, maybe, that sometimes during the day you waste time? Yes. Yes, yes of course. course. <laughs> <laughs> now, supposing you didn't waste time, then you could use that time for completing your assignment. Yes, I, I agree with you. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, but um, usually you need. Um, so if you have enough concentration. Yes. If Krishna gives you enough concentration, which happens. No, no. The Krishna will give you the concentration. So if Krishna's got to, you know, he's holding back. It's not Krishna's holding back. We're holding back. That's that's you know placing the blame on the wrong person. <laughs> it goes over here. We'll go the other direction. Supposing you didn't hear what you heard last year, so you didn't put you know the big rock in first. You didn't do your devotion to Krishna first. What would this year have been like? But, but you know you, you you answered it within the question. There are days when you don't do your devotion so nicely, and what happens? Everything becomes difficult, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Supposing your whole year was done like that, difficult days would have been difficult, and, and difficult days, or excuse me, normal days would have been difficult, and difficult days would have been impossible. You'd be crushed, like paste, masala, or something. <laughs> so now this year, rather than go, you know, thinking, oh, I didn't get the project done because I did my worship in the morning. You could think two things. What was the quality of that? Because when I do things in a quality way, I don't find that problem. So let me do that devotional practice in a quality way in the morning. That's where the key is. And then second thing, because it follows the first thing, is let me not wait. Let me look at the ways in which I waste time. Let me like do less of that time wasting. I mean, ideally, just like no time wasting, but at least, you know, a modest amount of time. You know. can't be fanatic. You have to have some time wasting. And just do less time wasting. So you do better qualities this year. Better quality devotional practice in the morning and less somewhat selectively. Keep your favorite ones, but the less time wasting during the day. If you, all your projects will be done, you won't have that lamentation in the evening. But you know what will happen? Krishna will give you more service. <laughs> it's always like that. Always like that. Why? So that you're in this, not in anxiety, but you're in the mood of calling out to Krishna. That's what you need to do. I mean, it's, it's like that forever. That's not bad. That's good. You know, I just, I can sh share with you. I've said this for the last 20 years. You chant nicely. You're asking Krishna for service. And he'll hear your prayer for service. He'll give you so much service. <laughs> just stick around Hari Vilas for a while and you get so much service. <laughs> you won't have time for anything. Your family and your japa, you forget it. Just, you know, do service. So you do your chanting nicely. And your service will increase. But that's good. Then you're more dependent upon Krishna. That's the operative, that's the bhakti principle. We, we feel that it's a good feeling. It's not a desperate feeling. So now, then you're more concentrated and more concentrated and more concentrated and more, more very focused on each thing that you do because it's for Krishna more than just you know, an accomplishment. And I put a little mark by my name. I got five gold stars today because I'd accomplished a lot. For Krishna. 
And that's the strength that will enable you to get your projects done and not waste time and do nice devotional practices every day. First thing, qualitatively increased and time wasting diminished. And watch your service grow. <laughs> Unendingly. Thank you for taking that seriously for the whole year. That's really remarkable. Krishna will see that effort. Then give you this other little anxiety so you can go the next step. It's not a... You know, I, I wasted my time so I didn't get my project done. Okay. Yes. Cooking that you have to do next. <laughs> something. And that happened here at the Jaffa retreat? Are you still thinking about the. What about today? You didn't have to cook. <laughs> Was your mind freed or still bothered? <laughs> well, it's back to the, 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 the theme or topic of purification. What to do? Further purification. And purific further purification doesn't just mean um, you know, nose to the grinding stone. It means, you know, this calling out, or it, it, qualitatively calling for Krishna, you know, intensifying the effort that you make. Even if you don't intensify the effort that you make, purification will still go on. But it's purification, purification, because this other is residual tendency from long material contact. <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll, I already answered your question, but now I'll answer your question in a different way. I'll ask you, answer your question with a question. Would you care to guess how many lifetimes you've been in the material world, engaged in fruitive activity? How many? Timeless. So that tendency is very long-standing tendency. Yes. So now you become a nice devotee, you're trying to become nice devotee, and you're chanting, and that tendency is continuing, and you're saying, what to do, this tendency is continuing. You're paying the price for that so many lifetimes of fruit of activity tendency. It's continuing. But just, you know, continue. so you, you continue in the devotional way, the purification method. Quantitatively and qualitatively, just like here, the Japaruji. Quantitatively and qualitatively in the association of devotees. Both, quantitatively, and, and just continue. And that tendency will gradually subside. I'll tell a little s s story anecdotal story. Um, when I, the, the first temple I lived in uh, was the Boston Temple. I went to school in upstate New York. But I went, went to visit Boston to see about graduate schools. And I visited the Boston Temple. It was just this amazing place at that time. Iskand Press was there, which meant all the artists and the, the Sanskritists and the transcribers and like this, these awesome group of, you know, very talented, very intellectually, very strong, enthusiastic devotees. 
plus the regular temple devotees. So I went and joined the Boston Temple. And when I first got there, they gave me the service of washing the pots. <laughs> and I was, you know, this puffed up college student thinking, I know how to do more than wash pots. <laughs> Don't they know who I am? I mean, I think literally like that, but you know, like a puffed up person thinks about themselves. And uh, I was trying to be conscientious, so I washed the pots carefully. I said, oh, you're doing such a nice job. You have a new service. You're just, you're, you're a pot washer. We needed a pot washer, and Krishna sent you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the pot sink for the kitchen was right at the bottom of the Brahmachari ashram stairs. They go out the back door, so they get in the van and go on Harinam. And every day they go out and Harinam. They yay, Harinam. And they have to wash thing and wash pots. I want to go on Harinam, chant, and be happy. Then one devotee stopped and said, you know what Prabhupada said? He said, if you wash the pots, you're cleansing your heart. So being a smart Alec college student, I thought under my breath, oh yeah. Why don't you stand here next to me? Wash your <laughs> but I didn't say it. I just like <laughs> my mind about it. <laughs> and it went on like that for a whole month. Every day, going down the stairs. This is summertime too. You know, I'm in the temple all day long washing pots. <laughs> you know, puffed up college student washing pots. That's not why I came to the Hare Krishna temple to wash pots. I'm going to go on Hare now. But then I finally, you know, I just surrendered. And said, okay, Prabhupada said, I'll cleanse my heart. Let me apply myself with that instruction. Let me cleanse my heart. And I felt my heart was becoming cleansed by washing the pots related to your question. And then somebody came along and said, oh, you're doing such a nice job. Let me tell you another Prabhupada said. You should wash the pot so nicely you can see your face in the bottom of the pot. <laughs> <laughs> and at that time, the temple was poor. I mean, we didn't have anything. It was used pots. <laughs> so the bottom of the pot was completely black. <laughs> So I said, okay, Prabhupada said, to see your face in the bottom of the pot. So I scrubbed and I scrubbed and it took days and days and scrubbing and scrubbing so that every single pot, you could see your face in the bottom of the pot. Not where the food goes, but where the fire goes. And then somebody came along and said, guess what? We have somebody else that can wash the pot. Come on out with us on hurry now. And the light went on. Like Krishna just wanted my surrender. He didn't want me to just stay forever and wash pots, although I guess, you know, if he had wanted that, I could have done that, but he wanted my heart, my surrender. So if you want your mind to be controlled, give your mind to Krishna. Take, take this instruction of chanting with attention as Krishna's instruction. And you know what? Within Krishna's instruction, there's the power to carry out Krishna's instruction within the instruction. You don't need a lobotomy. You need Krishna's instruction. Take it within your heart. And then the mind can be controlled. And that's the price that we have to pay for our so many lifetimes of being rebellious and doing fruit of activity, thinking, you know, I do and I get. It, but it doesn't happen that way with spiritual. It's a different paradigm, different set of laws. As Krishna says, and we surrender to Krishna, and Krishna uses us as an instrument. And that's the price. So keep chanting in that consciousness. And that way the mind can become peaceful. Because it's not our interest, it's Krishna's interest that's being served. 
And that's nice. Not only it's nice because the mind will be controlled, but it's nice because Krishna will be pleased. Just adopt that mood of chanting. I just read that today. Prabhupada was speaking to someone. We chant because it's pleasing to Krishna. Just like if someone calls your name. You're sitting somewhere and someone calls your name. Oh? <laughs> and where, do, where does that psychology come from in us? It comes from Krishna. Krishna is very pleased when people... It's not because he's, you know, egocentric. It's actually, it's love. They're reviving their Krishna consciousness. How nice. They'll become again happy. How nice. Let me help them. And when we feel Krishna is helping, because we're, we're submitting in a loving way to Him, that's the happiness that we want. The, the mind is easy. The mind goes to Krishna instead of to stuff. So keep chanting. It's the means of purification. And then chant in a qualitative way, in addition to the numerical way. Yes. Well, you, you gave two options, and I'll give some other options besides your two options. Is that all right? <laughs> because tongues to tiksha svabharata, to tolerate, means, this is my understanding of what it means, there's where our consciousness is now invested in duality. And there's duality. There's happiness and distress, <coughs> light and dark, winter and summer season, honor and dishonor. Duality. So withdraw consciousness from duality and place it somewhere else. Place it in, in the absolute realm. Place it upon Krishna. Okay, so now that's what tolerance means. Withdraw from the temporary and repose a direct consciousness upon the eternal. So now, that's first. That's the tolerance part. Then you added another thing. There's some disturbance over there with something at work or in a relationship or whatever it is. So now that I have my attention directed towards Krishna, I'm Krishna's servant. Staying in that paradigm or that, that realm of being Krishna's servant, Here's some service. Here's my work, or here's a friend, or here's whatever it is, a relationship. Now, how can I be in service to Krishna in this situation or that situation? So I, I do something. It may, it, you know, that something that I do may, you know, re remain neutral. It may, you know, say something, maybe silent for the moment and wait for the right moment, or maybe so many things. But I can do things in service to Krishna, in Krishna consciousness, not in a reactive, circumstantial panic, forget Krishna and run after, you know, fixing the problem. That's material consciousness. I'm not going to abandon Krishna. But I may very well, in Krishna consciousness, take some action, depending upon what's, you know, what's appropriate for the circumstance and what will be pleasing to Krishna. There's, there's all kinds of diversity in the spiritual, in the realm of the internal potency. We do all kinds of things in service to Krishna. The tolerate is just the beginning part of withdraw from duality and invest in absolute. Okay. Something 
something over here? Someone? Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> where is the part of? the rest of us that's not our experience. The mind is over here and over there and all around town. Anywhere but one place, the holy name. And if your mind is with the holy name, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but the surrendering is a mood. It's what the soul feels towards Krishna. And in that surrendering process, there's things that we, there's behaviors, what we do. From that mood, or you say, bhava, of surrender. Then, the, you know, the ears go, and the, the mind goes, and the tongue goes, and the senses go, and they, they follow that, you know, what's inside comes outside. But it starts with the mood of surrender. So it's before, during, and after. But the real hearing is when there's all that alignment. And generally it takes some time and purification for the alignment to take place. In the beginning it's just practice. Sadhana. We chant because we're enjoined by scripture and the teachings of our spiritual master to do so. Because we have to because there's some bhava going on or something. All right. Yes? Are there minimum qualities that a dis the devotee should develop before approaching a spiritual master for shelter or surrender? Well, what comes to mind is a very rare commodity these days, and that's common sense. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> uh, A word that Prabhupada would, would use instead of common sense is be practical. You know, c connect. Um, connect the teachings with a, with a sincere effort. To apply the teachings in our life. And, 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 and with that, you know, the, the, the source of the teachings. In, in ISKCON, you know, it, it's, it's quite simple and, and universal, and that is we have a founder acharya. And the founder acharya's books and teachings in various forms, recorded and others, um, that's our shiksha. So we hear or read his shiksha using Prabhupada's words, try to understand. We would say that phrase many times, try to understand. So we should try to understand. And then we take that which, to the, to the best of our ability that we've understood, and we bring it inside. And then we try to, in practical ways, live our life accordingly. That's, you know, that's a prerequisite. That's, you know, that's the, what I'm saying, common sense or, you know, practical application. One, one who's sincerely trying to do that, 
in a consistent manner, sincerely trying to, uh, hearing or reading, trying to understand, trying to bring within their heart and live their life accordingly. That's a good position. That's a good prerequisite. Because then there's others that are nicely following Prabhupada and Prabhupada's teachings. And where do we where do we see so there's the there's the sun and then here's the object I hold up to the light of the sun. How 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 transparent is that object with the light of the sun? How close does this person, that person match the, these teachings I've heard from Srila Prabhupada that I've tried to understand and tried to bring into my life? Now I need some more careful guidance in how to apply these teachings in my life in a practical way, besides the universal understandings. I need that guidance. I need the instruction of someone. Here's something that I heard Prabhupada say, personally. It was in a, a lecture where Prabhupada was speaking in language that he would often use. One must approach a bona fide spiritual master and take shelter of him. Prabhupada was speaking about that topic. And in the audience there was, a, a, you know, an uncultured Western American fellow who just interrupted Prabhupada right in the middle without even raising his hand, just blurted out, Swamiji. How do I know who's a bona fide spiritual master? So Prabhupada stopped lecturing and just addressed his question. And he addressed his question in this way. He said, um, when you go to the marketplace to buy a diamond, you must first must know what a diamond is, because otherwise you'll be cheated. So learn, it's, it is the duty of one who is to find a bona fide spiritual master to know what one is. So there's, you know, the teachings, that's the light of the sun. Then we hold the object before the light of the sun and see, does it match? By what standards is one to know? So it starts with... fundamental thing and you, then you go to the application of the fundamental thing and see how how it matches and then you see if it's done prematurely then all kinds of things that are strange you know, can, can happen and often or sometimes at least happen something silly Okay. Well, we have 15 minutes. If we're done with questions, I guess we can take a little slow chapel walk over to the hall, get set up, and have a care time at 6.30. Okay? See the Prabhupada key? Yeah. Yeah.